both the essay that Jim gave us and the longer article by Jim and Dan are really first-rate pieces of work. Um, like all of Jim's work, they are smart, thoughtful, exhaustively researched, and they definitely should prompt some refinement of the Supreme Court's, the modern Supreme Court's claims about Article Three. But I'm more sold on one of Jim's refinements than on another. The refinement that I'm sold on involves the injury in fact requirement. Admittedly, that requirement does have some historical support. For instance, in a chapter called Of Courts in General, Blackstone purported to describe all courts of justice, courts of equity and of law, courts of record and not of record. In every court, Blackstone wrote, there must be at least three constituent parts, the actor or plaintiff who complains of an injury done, the reus or defendant who is called upon to make satisfaction for it, and the eudex or judicial power. But as Jim explains, it's not really true that all cases are about making satisfaction for an injury done, or even about averting a threatened injury. An injury, in fact, might be an essential prerequisite for many kinds of cases, but some other cases aren't naturally described in those terms. That's not to say that Congress can let anyone litigate over anything, regardless of the concrete interests at stake. I think that there are limits on the kinds of interests that will support private litigation in federal court. But I agree with Jim that the concept of a litigable interest goes beyond the notion of an injury. Years ago, Professor Edwin Borchard identified three different categories of judgments, executory, declaratory, and investitive. Most judgments are executory in the sense that they can be executed. And at least according to Borchard, executory judgments or cases seeking executory judgments fit Blackstone's pattern. The plaintiff is seeking redress for some sort of past or threatened wrong. Maybe you could force Black, uh, Borchard's second category, declaratory judgments, into that same template, although Borchard himself was skeptical of that. But I want to call attention to the third category, investitive judgments. In contrast to executory and declaratory judgments, which involve identifying pre-existing legal relations, investitive judgments, or what Borchard called investitive judgments, create a new status or relation. Think of some kinds of in rem cases, where the court's decree itself transfers title. Or think of divorce cases, where the court's decree changes the party's status from married to unmarried. Lots of the examples in Jim's paper involve investitive judgments. For example, under the early naturalization statutes, the court's decree itself changed somebody's status from alien to citizen. Likewise, in prize cases, when a court determined that a ship was good prize, the court's decree was what transferred title from the former owners to the captors. And in bankruptcy cases, when a court grants a discharge, it isn't saying that the debtor didn't owe any money before now. The decree is changing the legal relations between the debtor and his creditors. Cases seeking investitive judgments always involve what I think of as litigable interests, but I agree with Jim that it is not always natural to describe those interests as injuries. So I'm sold on the desirability of refining the injury in fact requirement. I'm gonna be more obstinate about the adversity requirement. In addition to arguing that an injury in fact is not an essential prerequisite for every kind of case, Jim also tries to shed new light on how the word cases in Article Three might differ from the word controversies. Under what I think of as the conventional understanding of Article Three, the word controversies referred exclusively to civil suits, while the word cases included both civil suits and criminal prosecutions. Jim doesn't disagree with that, but he argues that the word cases is broader than the word controversies in another sense as well. The concept of a controversy requires adverse parties, while the concept of a case doesn't, or at least doesn't always. For originalists, Jim offers two different types of evidence. First, he points to early statements about the meaning of the word cases in Article III, like Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in Osborne against Bank of the United States, which Justice Story echoed in his commentaries on the Constitution. But those statements strike me as ambiguous. At least as I read Osborne, 
Marshall wasn't focusing on the same questions as Jim. And I can't tell from Osborne whether Marshall would have agreed with Jim or not. A quarter century before Osborne, Marshall did make some statements that may cut against Jim's position. In 1800, Marshall was a member of Congress during the hullabaloo over the treatment of Jonathan Robbins, a man whom the United States had extradited to stand trial for mutiny on board a British ship. Critics of the Adams administration accused President Adams of having improperly interfered with the judicial proceeding, and Marshall gave a high-profile speech in the House of Representatives in defense of the Adams administration. Among other things, Marshall discussed what Article III means by cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution, laws, or treaties of the United States. As reported in the Annals of Congress, here's what he said, quote, a case in law or equity was a term well understood and of limited signification. It was a controversy between parties which had taken a shape for judicial decision. So at least in 1800, Marshall was associating a case with a controversy between parties. To me, Jim's second type of evidence is potentially more powerful. Jim argues that the actual practices of federal courts over history are inconsistent with the idea that a case requires adversity. I really admire this aspect of the paper. Jim has brought together a whole bunch of practices that prior scholars haven't thought about in these terms, but I'm not yet persuaded that he draws the right conclusion. To evaluate Jim's argument, I'm gonna proceed a little indirectly. I'll start by trying to identify the most plausible version of an adversity requirement that might be built into the word cases in Article III. Then I'll ask whether Jim's data points rule out that version of an adversity requirement. To begin with, any plausible version of an adversity requirement that might be built into Article III needs to accommodate the fact that federal courts can adjudicate cases against parties who haven't appeared in court. For instance, Congress can authorize federal courts to enter default judgments. Sure, the Due Process Clause often prevents judgments from binding somebody who had no opportunity to appear, but by the late 18th century, even England's common law courts had authority to proceed to judgment against a defendant who was defying a summons, and the Judiciary Act of 1789 explicitly refers to default judgments. So whatever the concept of a case might require in the way of adversity, it does not always require a clash of adversaries who are both actually present and participating in the proceedings. United States against Windsor illustrates a different point. By the time Windsor got up to the Supreme Court, it raised a question about what the Supreme Court calls appellate standing. But let's just think about the situation in the district court. At the district court level, there was one sort of adversity between Ms. Windsor and the United States. Ms. Windsor wanted the government to refund hundreds of thousands of dollars in estate taxes that she had paid, and the government wasn't doing so. But another sort of adversity was missing. The government's lawyers in the executive branch agreed with Ms. Windsor that the law required the government to pay Ms. Windsor the money, even though the government wasn't doing so. All the justices in Windsor thought that at least at the district court level, this was still a case within the meaning of Article III, and that has to be right. If I owe you a million dollars and you sue me in federal court to collect, I can't deprive the court of the power to enter a judgment simply by agreeing that you're absolutely correct and that I am violating the law. <laughs> I can moot the case by paying up, but I can't moot the case just by agreeing with your legal argument. So to the extent that an adversity requirement is built into the concept of a case, it's got to be about clashing interests rather than clashing arguments. Putting those points together, the most plausible version of an adversity requirement that might be built into the word case would require only a clash of litigable interests, not necessarily a clash of legal arguments, and it wouldn't necessarily require the owners of the clashing interests to appear in court and participate in the proceedings. Let's think about whether the data points that Jim discusses rule out that version of an adversity requirement. As Jim says, the hardest data points for me to explain are the examples of what he calls original non-contentious jurisdiction. And to keep within some semblance of my time limit, 
I'm going to focus on the historical examples that Jim offers. On page 15 of the condensed version, he lists four categories of examples from the 19th century. Naturalization proceedings, prize cases, bankruptcy petitions, and warrant, warrant applications. Bankruptcy cases don't bother me. It's true, as Jim says in the longer article, that the debtor can get a discharge of his debts even if no creditors appear in the proceeding and submit claims. But while there can be a bankruptcy case if no creditors appear, I don't think there can be a bankruptcy case if no creditors exist. Assuming that there's at least one creditor and the debtor is seeking a discharge of his obligations, I would say that the debtor and his creditors have adverse litigable interests. I would say the same thing about prize cases. The people who want the ship to be declared good prize, establishing their ownership of it, have adverse litigable interests to the former owners, even if the former owners don't appear and contest the claim that the ship is good prize. Proceedings under the early naturalization statutes are harder for me, a lot harder. Jim tells us how they worked. The alien could apply to a court, including a federal court, and the court would grant the alien's application for citizenship if the court was satisfied that the alien met the statutory criteria. To judge from the form of the proceeding, there was just one party. Still, I take Justice Brandeis's opinion in Tudin against the United States to characterize claims for citizenship as claims against the United States. So maybe the early naturalization proceedings were not really cases in which there was only one party, but rather were cases in which only one party had the right to participate. If Congress had set up a system where the alien was supposed to name the United States as a defendant in suits for citizenship, but the government's lawyers made case-by-case -case determinations about whether to participate in the proceeding or instead to default, I would be willing to characterize all of those proceedings as cases between the alien and the United States. Maybe the early naturalization acts can be seen as simply taking the government's lawyers out of the picture. Naturalization proceedings, on this view, would be cases between the alien and the United States, but the statutes categorically waived the United States' right to appear, or at least its right to appear as a, in a formal way. Warrant applications arguably illustrate the same point in reverse. When law enforcement officers ask a federal court for a warrant enabling them to arrest me or to search my house, the officers and I both have litigable interests at stake, and those interests are adverse. If the court issues the warrant, I probably won't have a good trespass claim against the officers who execute the warrant. Despite the fact that I definitely have litigable interests at stake, I don't get notice of the warrant and the opportunity to participate in the warrant application proceeding. The proceeding is ex parte. But that doesn't necessarily keep the proceeding from being considered a case between adverse parties, the officers and me, or maybe the government and me. Of course, once we see that I have litigable interests at stake in this case, we'll wonder whether the due process clause requires me to get notice and the opportunity to participate. But the answer might be no. Even though I do have litigable interests at stake in this case, there's a detached and neutral magistrate who is exercising judgment as to whether the government has met the requirements for a warrant, and maybe that's all that due process requires in this special context. In most other contexts, you can't tell the same story about the due process clause. In the standard case between adverse parties, the due process clause requires that both sides at least have the opportunity to show up and participate. But maybe the difference between warrant applications and other cases is less about the adversity requirement and more about the due process clause. My bottom line is that ex parte doesn't necessarily mean non-adverse. I think that Article III tolerates some ex parte proceedings in federal court, but I'm not yet persuaded that there's such a thing as a genuinely non-adverse case. So thanks very much, Caleb. That's helpful. Um, I'm actually a believer in your suggested case or controversy distinction. That is that cases include criminal matters and controversies only include civil matters. And I was an early advocate of that view. The only point we would add is that perhaps that distinction doesn't exhaust the differences between, between cases and controversies. And so 
uh, uh, maybe there's more juice to squeeze out of that difference in language. Um, just a quick response on the Robbins case, the, the early extradition case. It's quite right that Marshall made the speech that you describe in his capacity as a member of the House of Representatives making a political speech about a defense of the Adams administration, not necessarily speaking in a judicial capacity about the meaning of Article III. Um, and in addition, when the, when the dust settled in the extradition context, the process that was put in place was at pains to preserve a role for the courts in making an, an initial determination about uh, extraditability as a prelude to the exercise of executive power and deciding whether to actually extradite or not. So uh, I, I wouldn't um, perhaps ascribe as much significance to Marshall's comments in the Robbins debate as I would to his judicial comments as a member of the court. Um, I'm happy to embrace your, uh, your, your, uh, your suggestion that the injury in fact showing uh, persuades you, and I, I certainly appreciate your saying as much. Um, on the adverse party side of things, there's much that you say that I agree with. Um, uh, uh, I think naturalization cases may be the toughest uh, and even there, you know, the U.S. could have come back and filed a kind of petition for quorum nobis or something like that, even in the 19th century, contesting what they regarded as a wrongly issued uh, petition or certificate of naturalization. So maybe the potential adversity was there, even though it wasn't hardwired into the uh, naturalization statute. So, uh, so I think there's, uh, there's something to all of that. Um, in, in arguing against a thoroughgoing or a full-throated adverse party requirement, I guess a couple of uh, uh, responses come to mind. Um, first, the justification as put forward by many folks in favor of the requirement is the quality of the record provided by adverse party presentation to simplify the judicial task of reaching a resolution or a conclusion. And obviously, if all you have is a hypothetical adverse party, the record doesn't get improved. And the second point is that much of the court's own Article III jurisprudence on the question of whether hypothetical or potential uh, interests are sufficient to ground the court's power to adjudicate are quite suspicious of that idea, especially in the injury and in fact uh, context, as the Clapper case, I think, quite nicely illustrates. There, uh, it seems quite likely that there was a potential impact on the parties who were seeking uh, to invoke the power of the court, but the court was quite clear that these kinds of hypothetical interests weren't going weren't to get you uh, to the promised land of Article III standing. So um, to say that potential adversity, uh, the possibility of adversity is enough. I think it does answer many of the ancillary examples that you identify. That is to say, I would completely agree, uh, and we say as much in the paper, that um, one can't defeat the judicial power by agreeing with the claims made by an opponent. Um, the, the court has the power to decree, and the plaintiff seeking that decree has the entitlement, the right, the property interest, if you will, in obtaining a judgment that will support uh, collection efforts or whatever. Um, so uh, we're, we're in complete agreement about that um, and about much else I'm happy to report.